You guys ready to go get something to eat? Let's do it. Let's do it. chatters. Today we're going to show you how to butcher a deer. Uh, we're going to be butchering a white-tailed deer, but this method would work for any uh, large game, you know, mule deer, sheep, caribou, elk, moose. Um, you know, the method's really not any different. Let's walk through the equipment. Uh, my favorite is a long bladed fillet knife. I'll mostly use it, uh, but then I also have some stiff kitchen knives and even like a rather large cleaver. Uh, this little sharpener, it's your best friend, a Smith's sharpener, they're like seven bucks, and I think they do a great job. Um, so this is mostly stuff you just have around the house already, you know, like we need some cookie sheets to lay ground meat on and pieces ready to be ground, some bowls to lay chunks of meat in or roast, uh, cutting boards obviously. And then you can use a vacuum sealer, they work great, uh, but honestly what we've done my whole life is we've used a, a double Ziploc system. So we got quart size bags, we'll put basically a dinner's worth of meat in a quart size bag, you know about for our family like a pound and a quarter pound of meat. And then we squeeze all the air out and we'll put uh, three or four of these uh, little Ziploc bags inside of a gallon Ziploc bag and squeeze the air out. And for red meat, it'll last up to, well, really like two years in the freezer. For fish and birds, you know, about a year. And so it, it really works well. Um, the one piece of equipment you might not just have laying around your house is a meat grinder. You know, you look at catalogs, there's a lot of professional grade meat grinders out there for $500, $1,500. Um, really want to be a bad purchase if you're 20 years old and you're going to use this meat grinder your whole life. Because um, the nice thing about the big ones, they have larger motors, you can really whiz through the meat really fast. Um, but I'll be honest with you, just a $60 meat grinder works fine. That's what this is. And you'll probably get through uh, 10 or 15 big game animals before you burn this guy up. So when you think about it, 60 bucks to get to butcher 15 animals, it's not bad. Do you want to talk about how we also like the idea of having the smaller grinder because it forces us to trim our meat and cut it into smaller pieces. And so we get to be a little bit more selective in our, our cleaning and butchering process. So that's a good point. If you bring your uh, deer to a butcher, um, you know, they are a business, so they're trying to get through these animals rather quickly. So they have these giant meat grinders with big old necks on it, so they are they can put a cube of meat in that big. And so they're not really forced to chop the meat up very fine, and also there's, you know, they're less likely to trim a lot of the fat off. Like, uh, we like to try to keep our meat pretty healthy, so we trim all the visible fat off deer and elk and that kind of thing. And so uh, what's nice with the small grinder, you're already cubing it up rather small anyway, so you can really get in there and really trim all the visible fat. And so you end up with a really lean meat. Um, of course, that's up to you. You you know, some people even add pork or beef fat and they won't trim much existing fat. Um, because the idea is they, they want it just to be full flavor. So, you know, I'll leave that choice up to you. Um, but I like to eat a lot of meat and I love to hunt. And so for me, the right choice is to trim off all visible fat. So I probably end up with meat that's 5% fat at the most. And so it's, it's very healthy. Uh, 
today we're going to be, we have a deer in our cooler that's already quartered out. So we have uh, two rear legs, two front legs, and then we have a bag of loose meat, which is the back straps uh, back here, tenderloins, and then it's all the meat off the neck, brisket. Uh, we've already trimmed all the meat off the ribs and in between the ribs. Um, but of course, what you could have done is took a saw and cut off the rib cages whole, and then maybe cut them in half so that they're, you know, eating size, grilling size. Uh, but we chose to just take all the loose meat off the ribs out in the field. We were two miles in when we got the deer. And uh, so we'll just end up grinding up the, the rib meat. Um, all right, let's get started. I got half of my deer in the sink here. It's all been washed off. Uh, we were careful when we were out in the field to make sure we didn't get a lot of hair on the meat and we never laid the meat on the ground. We always found a nice clean rock in the shade. So it was pretty clean to begin with, but uh, you know, we went ahead and gave it a real good rinse. And so I'm gonna start with the loose meat, which is, some of it's gonna turn into hamburger, some of it'll be roast, I'll explain. Uh, this was some of the meat around the flank on the outside of the ribs here. Um, often this is going to be the hardest to deal with pieces because uh, chances are that's where you shot the animal. So sure enough, when we are out in the field, we tried to get rid of most of the gunshot. Uh, but you can see like this piece here still has a little bit on there. And you know, you really don't want to mess with that because it's it's got lead in it. Um, I suppose if you're shooting a lead-free bullet, it wouldn't be as bad, but uh, we, we like the stopping power of a lead bullet, so, so that's what we were using. Uh, so I, I'm going to go ahead and do some additional trimming off of that to get rid of all that bloodshot area there. It's probably just bruised meat. There's probably not lead in there, but just to be sure. Okay, so that was the only area on my loose meat that had any concern like that. Um, deer fat... And elk fat, moose fat, it can be kind of a chalky fat. Um, when it's ground up in your ground meat, it's it's not too bad, but it's still, you know, it's an artery clogger, so we like to trim it all off. So we're gonna trim off all this visible fat. So I just fillet it, just kind of like I'm filleting a fish meat off of a off the skin here. I'm just filleting that fat off. And then I end up with pieces like that. And then for our grinder, we need pieces about that big to put in the grinder. And what I like to do for my grind is I like to have uh, multiple buckets going. And the reason is I'll put a little bit of neck meat in each one, a little bit of front leg meat in each one, a little bit of rear leg meat in each one. because. Uh, each of those areas have different qualities and I like to kind of mix them together and get an average. Um, you know, if you had all neck meat and that kind of stuff can be real sinewy and stuff and so I wouldn't want a whole meal of just that, but a little bit mixed in, you know, it, it does pretty good. But again, my goal right now is just to trim all the visible fat off my loose meat and uh, Also, put, make sure it's a piece small enough to fit in my grinder. Yeah, and this is also a choice time to take off any of this weird skin casing, um, or not skin casing, but muscle casing. Get that out of there, that'll get caught in your grinder. Tendons, that can get caught in your grinder. You see pieces of hair that maybe you missed when you were washing. All that can be cleaned up as you're doing the trim process. Yeah, and this, this process can go a lot faster if you're gonna go for full flavor and you're gonna have more fat in your meat because uh, then you're really just trying to chop it up small enough to fit in your grinder. And again, that's, that's what a professional butcher is gonna be doing because um, you know, they're not the ones worried about your health. Uh, they just wanna get through it quick and plus they want you to be happy when you eat a hamburger that's 20% fat. It definitely tastes good. Uh, let's talk about another special piece of meat. This is backstrap. 
So that came off along the spine there. Um, I never grind my back strap. It's such a precious piece of meat. Uh, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna save it for roast. And then later on, if I wanna take that roast and slice steaks out of it, I can, but I'd rather freeze it as a whole roast. Uh, or I can smoke it as a roast or crock pot it as a roast, but I'm gonna for sure keep it as a roast. So I'm gonna cut down to the, the tendon. There's a big long uh, tendon along here, sinew. So I'm gonna cut down to that and then I'm gonna fillet the roast off of that sinew. And then I'm also gonna trim off any fat That also helps your meat stay longer in the freezer without getting rancid is if you trim off all the fat. Um, but it, you know, it would stay good for a long time anyways. Okay, so there's a roast that has uh, basically all the fat trimmed off. And again, I can cut sections out of there and I can make New York strips. Uh, since this is a Coos whitetail deer, a small variety of whitetail, the New York strips wouldn't be near as big as a cow. Uh, but on an elk, you'll get a pretty big New York strip there. And even though they're not large, they're very tasty. So I'm going to put that in this bucket. That'll be for my roast. Now I'm going to turn the back strap around and continue filleting off the sinew. Uh, this sinew, you know, the natives a long time ago, that's what they'd use for the bowstrings, right? Or cordage. It's, it's extremely strong. Uh, here's the a tenderloin that's out of the inside rib cage area just in front of the pelvis and again if this was a cow this would be the filet mignon you would cut out sections of that and you'd have those circular filet mignon steaks uh, but a special meat I'm gonna leave it whole and freeze it as a, a roast and then uh, we can smoke it or cut it into steaks or roast it whole uh, so it's just going in, in the roast pile there's the other one. Let's talk heart and liver. Uh, this is a whitetail liver. And they're awesome, sliced up thin. And then, you know, you fry it in a pan with like liver and onions. It's, it's incredible, it's great. Uh, so we're just gonna bag it whole. And then the heart. Um, there's a lot of things you can do with the heart. There's all kinds of specialty recipes you can do with heart where you roast them whole, like slow roast them for a long period of time, maybe put them in a crock pot where they get really tender. You can slice them like quarter inch thick and pan sear these heart medallions. Uh, that's another good way. Um, I don't have any special plans for this heart and the heart from the other deer. So this is what happened, like the deer I shot, I shot it right through the heart because uh, I'm a better marksman than Cindy. Um, her heart though is in pristine condition and so uh, and actually I'm just joking you should never really aim for the heart you're really going for the lungs on an animal it's just kind of random chance or luck if you hit the heart uh, but since we only have one heart it's not worth doing a specialty recipe with heart so we're just gonna chop it up fine and we're gonna mix it in with the rest of our meat a little bit here and there to to grind up and it works fine doing that too. It has a slightly rubberier, rubbery, a slightly rubberier texture, but uh, you just mix up a little bit in with the rest of your meat and it's, it's fine. So that's what we're gonna do with the heart. So actually I forgot to tell you my funny liver story. Um, when I was in my early 20s, my uncle had got drawn for one of the buffalo hunts up by the Grand Canyon. So it's a really hard, uh, hunt to draw. He's real excited. And he ends up getting uh, his buffalo. And we get it back to camp and we got this big tripod set up where we're going to hang it and skin it. And um, The first thing I remember is we were going to take the tongue out, you know, because you always hear about buffalo tongue being like this fine delicacy. And we waited too long, you know, we're trying to pry that jaw open with tire irons and everything we could get. And it's just like rig a mortgage shut, you know, it, it happens pretty quick. Like if you don't cut out an animal's tongue within 20 minutes, uh, it's very tough to get out. 
But anyways, we gave up on the tongue. But uh, you can imagine a buffalo has a very big liver. I bet you this liver was this big and that wide. You know, it probably weighed, man, I don't know, like nine, 10 pounds. It was huge. And, uh, and I really liked liver and onions. So I was kind of in the habit of making large meals uh, like Sunday evening and then I'd, I could just thaw them out and uh, reheat them throughout the week you know, being a bachelor and all. And so I got out a big old thing of flour and I fried up all like nine, 10 pounds of this liver. And so you can imagine, I mean, this giant platter. And, uh, you know, I put it in individual bags and, and I would eat it all week long for dinner and lunch, dinner and lunch, dinner and lunch. And when I finally finished that uh, buffalo liver, I, I was just done with liver, like forever. And so I probably didn't eat another liver for, I'm guessing like 10 years, uh, cause I just wore it out. And so my advice on uh, elk or large animals, if you get the liver is uh, treat yourself to a, a fresh liver meal, uh, you know, once a month or so, but, but don't try to eat it all week long cause it'll wear you out. Uh, here I got some loose neck meat. Definitely a prime candidate for making grind. Um, you could also crock pot it and make like a stew. Uh, but I'm going to turn this into grind. So we do like to trim all the fat off, but uh, on neck meat and stuff, since it's so marbled throughout, uh, you know, we just work on it for a while and then eventually you kind of give up and just live with the fact that there's gonna be some fat in there. Still way healthier though than if you were to eat beef or store-bought chicken with the skin on or pork, you know. And, and of course this is all organic, you know. This is just a wild animal out in the woods. So I'm gonna let you work on the rest of the loose meat and then I'm gonna show a front leg. The, the loose meat's the fun stuff, huh? <laughs> The loose meat requires the most trimming, um, but it also really adds up, um, so it's worth your time. And again, you don't have to go to the lengths we go to, but there's this film on all of the meat, and oftentimes that's where you're going to see your hair, your um, your dirt, maybe any of the the insides that when you were gutting it got on the meat. So this is just a really good opportunity to use that skin as um, a way to remove all of that grubbiness and really get your meat clean, really get your meat lean. And so this is, it's worth the time. And once it's done, it's done. Uh, I've never ever had to drain my meat after I've cooked it because we do such a good job processing it up front that all we're dealing with is meat. No fat. All right, so this is a rear leg. You know, this is the big prize on any wild game, right? Is a, a rear leg is probably between the two rear legs, that's 50% uh, of all the meat on that animal. Um, sometimes people call them the hams, you know. But uh, anyways, I'm gonna trim off all the visible fat on the outside and then we're gonna take a couple roast off this rear leg because it's a prime candidate for getting some good roast. And then the rest of it will uh, chop into grind. And when I say grind, you know, hamburger, but you can always take that hamburger and turn it into sausage, brats, uh, summer sausage, whatever you want. Now if you're lucky enough to live in bear country or get a buffalo tag, uh, that fat is primo. Like you there's no chalkiness to it and it's delicious it doesn't go rancid it doesn't go rancid it's it's like a uh, beef fat and so the only reason to trim it is for health reasons in fact it tastes so good you really hate to trim too much of it uh, but deer i actually think the flavor is better and of course it's much healthier to trim that fat off Uh, but I gotta be honest, when I'm 90, I'll probably quit trim the fat off and 
I'll just go for full flavor. It's always worth your time to sharpen your knives as many times as you think you need to, or maybe even twice as much as you think you need to uh, during the process. Because if you have a sharp knife, the trimming and cutting process probably goes three to four times faster. You know, a job so much easier when you have the right tool. Okay, I got the fat trimmed off the outside of my uh, leg here. So now let's talk roast. I want to pull my roast off before I start going after grind. And there's a few methods you can choose when getting roast. Uh, you can tell where the muscles are separated. You know, here's a muscle here. Um, here. Here you can kind of see them. Uh, but what I like to do is I like to flip it upside down just like this. And I like to come in right where, you know, right down to what you would call the knee there until I can feel the bone and then I trim along the bone and I'm just riding that bone all the way up until I get my chunk. Now if I was going to have a giant party, lots of people, I could cook that dude whole, uh, maybe slow cook it in a crock pot a really long time. Um, but we have a family of four and that's way too much meat to eat in one sitting. So we're going to take this roast and just divide it into more dinner sized roast. You can see what I'm talking about, like you can tell where that muscles, those muscles are separated. In fact, you can almost pull it apart with your hand. These rear leg roasts are also great if you're wanting to make jerky. You know, you take that roast and slice it up into pieces about that big around, about an eighth of an inch thick, eight, eighth to a quarter inch thick, and then add your favorite seasoning or marinade and uh, then dehydrate it. Yeah, when you have a bigger animal, it's harder. Like, you have to decide between just getting that thing processed because it takes so much work. Or getting that thing processed and then taking another half day to a day to make specialty stuff because you actually have enough meat that you can make specialty stuff. Um, something that we've chose to do is when we have a really large animal, we just process it. We say to heck with the specialty stuff. Um, once it's in grind and roast form, you can always pull it out and make jerky or specialty meats later on. But uh, what we chose to do is if we have just a single small animal and we have plenty of just your general grind and roast, that's when we get crafty and start making broths, summer sausage, that sort of thing. Okay, so I am going to go ahead and take some more roast off this same rear leg. And then at that point, we might have enough roast that we might just take the other rear leg and make grind out of it. Um, anyway, so I'm going to turn my rear leg like this where the knee's facing up. I'm going to cut just behind the knee down to the bone and then I'm going to trim that bone until I come out. And there's my other roast. The rest of this will be grind. This lower part of the leg they call the shank has a lot of tendons in it and stuff but you chop it up fine and grind it and it's fine. It works out work great. Do you think that's enough roast? Because we still have another back strap, plus, you know, the other deer will have back straps. And yeah, that's, I think that's great, huh? Okay, so we're, we're officially on the grind train now. Everything's gonna be grind. Okay, so now we're gonna deal with the uh, front leg. Um, front legs are kind of tedious uh, compared to a rear leg. It seems like a rear leg, no matter which way you cut into that, you're gonna have the big hunk of meat with very little tendons very little fat. Uh, but the front legs uh, are shaped a little different. So I've already trimmed all the visible fat off this front leg. So this is what I have here. Um, this lower part's going to be shank. We're just going to trim it off and make it into hamburger. So I'm probably not going to show you that. But from here down, we're going to have larger 
pieces that could be used as roast, although I'm gonna just fillet them off and use them for hamburger. Uh, but this, there's a bone here, a big plate bone that runs like this. And then on top of that bone is another bone coming up. So it forms like a T shape. So we're gonna flay off both halves of that T. So I'm gonna, you can see the line there running down. I'm gonna fillet down till I can feel the shoulder plate and then I'm gonna turn the knife and run along that shoulder plate. And that's what's great about using a fillet knife. You know, it's real flexible and you can really trim that bone. Okay, so you can see I've trimmed that bone there. And then I'm gonna go ahead and uh, Cut that off. And I'll just set this to the side for now. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and flay the other half of that shoulder. And you know, if this was a elk or a mule deer or like an eastern whitetail, uh, these two pieces of meat here would actually be a decent roast, uh, but these coos deer are a lot smaller. So you're kind of pushing the limits, calling them a roast. Uh, there is a big chunk of meat here though, now that I got my shoulder bone like that and it's filleted off. I'm going to cut down here, trim along the bone and come out at the knee, and there's a pretty good roast there. So that would be a good roast, uh, but again, we already have enough roast, so we're going to go ahead and make this into hamburger for ourselves. And then basically at this point you really do just have stuff suitable for hamburger or stew meat. So we're just going to keep trimming off all the meat off of this. And there's a, a lot of meat on the back side too. We're going to fillet off that bone, fillet the meat off the bone on the back side here. And then the rest is just little pieces here that we keep uh, trimming off. Um, so you get the idea and of course you do the same thing to the other front leg. Okay, we have all of our meat chunked up now, which is great. We made a point to separate the meat by quality of meat. Um, some of it's more tenony or fatty than other pieces, so we um, kind of divvied it up. We're gonna mix it prior to the grinding process, but we got all of our meat chopped up, and this is just our grind. We already have a whole bunch of roasts in the freezer, um, as well as the liver and I took some flank and I kind of turned it into a cinnamon roll type um, setup. I'm gonna freeze it and this one's gonna be a lot of fun. I don't know what I'm gonna layer in there or what we're gonna layer in there. We might do some onions, tomatoes, make maybe even some cornbread or some kind of stuffing, but get a, a Swiss roll, but it'll be a meat roll, Swiss roll, which would be pretty cool. Anyhow, we're ready to start grinding and at this point, this is where you would decide whether or not you want to add fat. We don't add any fat. In fact, we tried to trim as much as we could, but you can add as much fat as you want, 10% beef fat, 20% beef fat. You can also use pork fat. Uh, you can go to your local grocer and they'll be doing a lot of trimming early in the morning. And if you ask them for that fat, they give it to you for a great deal. Um, we use it when we make specialty items like breakfast sausage and brats. Chorizo um, is another one, summer sausage. But for all of our grind, we just make it as is, freeze it, tuck it away, and at any time we can pull that grind out and then mix into it if we want to, fat and other seasonings to get those specialty items. But um, right here, right now, just grind. Um, we'll get the process going. It's a little, a little slow going. It's not a big um, grinder, not a big motor but we'll get the meat going. Usually we get to where we um, got a rhythm going, somebody's grinding, somebody's bagging, and we're gonna get this meat in the freezer and preserved um, as soon as we can, because that's what's gonna give you your best tasting meat. You get it clean, you get it cold, and then you get it kept away as soon as possible. That makes it taste the best. All right, so Aaron's loading up the grinder right now. And as you can see, he's already got probably somewhere around 
I'd say six, seven pounds of meat. And it's already been ground and it's looking really good. Our grinder's kind of small, so we have four buckets of meat, you know, that are pretty sizable. And after each bucket, I'm gonna let the grinder kind of take a little five minute break, you know, just to rest the motor and all that and, and whatnot. Um, but these little cheap grinders are great. Like I said, we'll probably get 15, 20 large game animals uh, processed with this grinder, $60 grinder, before it dies on us. And uh, so yeah, they're, they're great. Uh, real quick, do you wanna show off this fancy little funnel you made? Oh, I just made this little uh, meat chute because it was always kind of awkward, you know, and you'd have meat all over your counter. And so this way it kind of funnels it into the cookie sheet. Uh, but anyways, yeah. Yeah, if, if it's not perfect, Aaron will find a way to fix it. So he may I believe in everything being jerry-rigged, and it wasn't quite jerry-rigged enough when we bought it, so we had to fix it up there. Yeah, uh-huh. So uh, check it out. All right. I can always tell how much uh, marbled fat there is in the animal by how sticky the meat is when I grind it. Let me see your fingers after you drop it. It's yeah, it's pretty. I sticky. would say it's medium stickiness as far as white tail. They they do have a tendency to have just slightly more marbled fat than mule deer. Um, these were predominantly grass-fed white tail where we shot them. I know we've got white tail closer to where we live that are eating acorns, and the meat will be really sticky. Yeah. Uh, so again, it's more flavorful, but then it's not as healthy as if it had less fat. Of course, it's still way healthier than beef from the store. Okay, so I got some roast here. Uh, this is backstrap. So, you know, I got my Ziploc. I labeled it Whitetail Backstrap November 21, 2021. So I put it in there. And I'm squeezing all the air out, kind of rolling it. Uh, but once I get those like that, then I'm gonna double bag to prevent freezer burn. And you wanna make sure you use freezer bags, not just uh, real thin Ziplocs. But anyways, I'm gonna put multiple dinner size roast inside this gallon freezer bag. And then I'm gonna squeeze all the air out as well. And I like to sure, make sure, uh, we like to make sure our freezer bags have the double seal. You know, it has two lines there, so for sure you're getting it. And then we put that dude in our freezer and uh, good to go for two years, although hardly ever does it last that long because usually you're consuming it. But uh, that's it, that's how we do the bagging. Hi, babe, guess what? We got something special for you. So you mentioned making some specialty meats uh, and adding fat and whatnot. Uh, what about just the hamburger? What do you make with it? So with hamburger, we do tacos. Um, in fact, we're going to make uh, tacos tonight for dinner. Um, but you can do tacos, enchiladas, burgers, um, lasagna, anything that you would do with a ground meat like beef, you can use deer or elk. Some of the stuff that you're using um, or that you might use it for might require the meat to be a little more sticky. So you can either add fat or you can add an egg. Occasionally we'll do that, um, we'll add an egg in. We have all of our tricks captured in this cookbook. Hold that up. <laughs> this is authored by Aaron and I, and we, we felt like something that people were missing in the whole hunting and gathering experience was the simple fact that this meat is no different than any of the meat that you get from the store. Um, and no different in, as far as the way you use it and the way you consume it. It can be used to make all of those homemade, grew up with meals. Um, the thing that um, is so amazing about this meat is it's organic, it's lean, and it's got that special seasoning that you gave it when you harvested it. Where would someone find a cookbook like this? I mean, do you have to travel to some far off land and get in a spaceship, go to Mars? Something this precious must be uh, hard to get. Believe it or not, it's fairly easy. So go to Amazon.com and look up Hunt and Gather with the Chatters cookbook. Yep. All right. 
Okay, so we finished grinding all of our meat. Uh, what happens though is when the grinder won't push any more meat through because it's basically emptied out, there's still some cubed up meat stuck in the screw drive here. And so all you gotta do is just take a little bit of your ground meat and put it in there, you know, maybe a cup of ground meat. And we'll use that ground meat to chase out the rest of the cube meat. And then when we clean out our grinder, it'll just be ground meat that's in the screw drive. After you get your grinder all cleaned up, uh, don't forget your loose meat that's inside the, the screw drive here. You know, that can go in your bags. Uh, there's always a bunch of tendons and stuff wrapped around the, the blade here. I'd already taken them off. So, you know, you want to throw that away. Well, and when you're processing a bigger animal, you're going to want to check that throughout the process. Yeah, that's a good point. Like probably every 40 pounds or so, you're going to want to unplug the grinder again because you only get 10 chances. Take the sinew stuff off the blade and then reassemble it. And uh, otherwise it can kind of be extra hard on the motor. But after we get it all cleaned up, we're going to dry it out real well. And then we're going to take uh, just cooking spray, you know, like spray oil. And we'll spray our plate and, uh, well, really just the plate that's the softer metal because it'll want to rust and that keeps it from rusting. And uh, I like to spray a little on the screw drive too, just to kind of lube it up so it's ready to go the next time. All right, so here is all the grind that we got from our deer. And we still have a bunch of roast already in the freezer. And something that I just wanted to show, we do go ahead and take the time to put what animal it is and also what it is, a grind or roast, and then the, the time. And the reason why is Aaron, it's his favorite thing at dinner time to say, you know, what animal are we eating? And it's fun to say whitetail or mule deer or elk. And so it's neat to know that it's not just deer, it's whitetail or it's mule deer. So um, occasionally we'll even get crazy and say the unit just because why not? You never know what they're eating in that unit and it makes it fun. So uh, we do label it that way. And uh, we're excited because it was a, a good amount and we're finally not low on meat. So thanks for watching Hunt and Gather with the Chatters and we'll see you next time when we go get something to eat. Thank you.